analysis, your response, and your critique. Um, Susan and I are going to have like a dialogical response. So I'll go first, and then she'll go, and then we'll just have an interaction. So I really wanted to thank you because, you know, once you write a book, it has a life of its own. So every time um, a student or someone approaches me to talk about this book, it's amazing um, how or what response that the book elicited. So thank you so much for your different approaches. I just wanted to say and emphasize, um, it was interesting how you, um, I forgot all your names, the third person, Cheryl, Cheryl uh, about how we were so transparent in how we came to write the book and how we even wrote the book and how we even chose the topic. But I think uh, the transparency was important and I think we both understood that the context and our own identity is so crucial to how we understand God in this world. So I was born in Korea, um, immigrated to Canada, so I grew up in Canada and then I teach here in the US. So many times in my life I always wonder who I would be if I just stayed in Korea. And I know I would not be who I am today because the context is so different. I would have been so, I, wouldn't, I know I wouldn't be speaking English the way I am speaking English. I wouldn't have married who I married and, and everything, what I have studied would probably have been totally different too. I would have had a totally different life if I stayed in Korea. So that's to say how important the context is and how context shapes who we are. So my context as an immigrant and experiencing um, racism in society and also um, in the church and also sexism has influenced how I think and understand God's presence and how I do theology. So I think that is just a crucial part and I'm so glad that you guys all emphasized it because for me, you know, even when I teach theology, I always say theology is biography and biography is theology. And I know whenever I say it, there's always going to be someone in the room, in my classroom, who will probably not agree with me. But if you read any theological text, any historical text, they're all situated in, in that context. And those theologians' life always comes through in, in the reading and in their writing. So if anyone challenges me that, I always throw it back. Even Augustine, anyone, Thomas Aquinas, anyone that you read, um, their biography came through, the struggles that they encountered, if you read the Ref Reformers, anybody, it comes through. So that's how we kind of began. And, you know, intersectionality has been around for a long time. So I'm a theologian and, and my wonderful co-writer um, teaches in gender, it's such a long, gender and sexuality. So I think our two different areas coming together was able to kind of um, make it a stronger, kind of collaborative, intersectional kind of work because my context is so different from Susan Shaw's context. And we had a book launch at Oregon State and you know, Susan's like, oh, we gotta put pictures of family and ordination because that was so important and we do talk about it in the book. And even the pictures, you can tell, our lives are so different and, and I think that makes it richer because we're coming at this important concept from two and multiple angles. And um, so I'll stop here and then we'll continue on. So Susan. I wanted to, to address some of the specific questions you all raised and thank you for those because I think they're, they're excellent. And so I wanna start with your questions about Jasper Puar's critique and, and others. Uh, and so what, what she suggests is that um, intersectionality is, is problematic as a metaphor because in some ways it suggests that perhaps gender, race, class, um, sexuality can somehow be these discrete categories. And so the intersections are more like a street intersection where things run together, but then they can be easily separated out. Uh, that's similar to, to Marilyn Fry's birdcage metaphor, where she talks about oppression as a birdcage. And that's been one of the critiques of that as well, is that somehow it envisions these wires, but the wires are still discrete. 
But you'll notice in the book, um, we write about it as confluence. Now, my, my science colleagues freak out when I use science terms, and they don't like it. But for me, as a non-scientist, confluence works because I think what happens, and I think this is inherent in intersectionality, as is explained by Hill Collins and, and certainly by Vivian May, is that there is a coming together so that what, what results is not one or the other, nor simply an additive both. And so with my students, what I use is the analogy of paint. And so if you take red paint and purple, uh, blue paint and you put them together and you have purple paint, which is not simply red and blue added, but something that, that's different. Um, and so I think that in some ways, if we look at how at least Grace and I have understood intersectionality and try to use it in the book based particularly on Vivian May's work, is that I think it's sort of moved beyond the, the metaphor is Kimberly Crenshaw first envisioned it. But I think that's something we have to keep in mind because I think it is very easy, as May talks about, to slip back into thinking of it as, as sort of discrete categories. Another critique, um, while I'm at it, that you, you didn't bring up, is that, uh, and this one usually comes from the right, that intersectionality is just a way of dividing us up into ever and ever smaller categories. But I think what Grace and I address in the book is that actually that makes it all the better because it means we need every piece of every body to understand the fullness of human experience. And so rather than seeing that as a weakness of intersectionality, I actually see it as a strength of it. Um, so hopefully that gets it at some of that. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, your question of, of interrogating, interrogating theology itself as a practice, which I think is such a great question. And for me, so, so my background is, is Baptist. And so as a Baptist, to paraphrase you know, bell hooks, I think that theology is for everybody. And so I don't think of theology as an academic discipline, but as a process that all people can engage in and do, even if they don't realize that they're doing theology, I think they are. And so I think you're right that there has to be a democratizing of theology for it to accomplish the kind of things that Grace and I are talking about, that it can't simply be done at the level of the academy. And so one of the ways we tried to address that in the book is, is trying to write in a more accessible way. And as a feminist scholar, I've always tried to do that. Even my university press books, I've tried to write. I mean, I, my mother's a high school grad and very smart woman, so I just try to write things my mother can read. Yeah. She wouldn't like anything I write, but at least she could read. <laughs> I'd rather she didn't read it either, but <laughs> don't put that out on Facebook or anything. Um, I wanted to, real quickly, too, also to in, in address Debbie's concern because I thought it was very provocative about um, engaging with conservatives and conservative texts and scholars. And I think you're right, that work needs to be done. I'm not the person to do it. <laughs> But you could be, you could be, and this is my hope, and, I, and I'll, t I'll tell you why I'm not, is, is th those are my traditions. And um, when, when you first said that, intellectually I went, ah, oh, yeah, and my gut really churned, and I thought, what is going on here? And it made me think of, of the wisdom about how somebody needs to work with perpetrators of abuse, but it doesn't need to be the survivor. And this is how I feel about sort of trying to address these things with conservative academics is I, I can't go back into that. And that's just, again, some more personal stuff that I think fits well with what we try to do in intersectional theology. Um, though I do try to engage it with my public scholarship. I mean, I blog about this stuff and I write in popular forums and it doesn't go well usually. But part of that is also about who I am personally now. I mean, I think as an out feminist, <laughs> I'm not gonna get a hearing no matter how much I try to address that. But I think somebody within the tradition like you could do that. And so to take what Grace and I have done and, and make it work for your tradition, I think would be brilliant and, and is much, much needed. Uh, and I just wanted to, to um, thank you for bringing up the pedagogical commitments because I think that was an important part of what we're doing. It's always kind of nice when you do something and then like readers recognize it and go, oh yes, and I saw this in the book. And you're like, yes. So that was one of those moments that, that I thank you for. And then. Jeff, I'm, I don't want to take up too much time, but I did want to say, if you ever come to Oregon, go to church with me because every part of you will be welcome there, I promise. <laughs> Let me turn it back to Grace. <laughs> so just to say um, a little bit, so thank you for addressing each person. I think something that came from um, uh, many of the, uh, read, um, um, what is it? The panelists, <laughs> I can't think right now, is how it applies to Christianity or how do you live this out? 
because that's an ongoing struggle. And when Jeff, when you shared your experience and all your experiences too, that is um, always painful because both Susan and I write out of pain too, of our own personal experiences of how we experience church and how we experience God in the church. So, um, you know, we do have chapters on, um, you know, reading scripture from an intersectional perspective, uh, intersectionality, and also how you can become church. So we're writing this in hopes, always, because um, your, I think, Susan's church right now is good, but majority of churches, you know, we experience so much pain, so, you know, and, but we will be able to find a community, a faith community, where we are fully accepted uh, without questions of our ableism, our, our income, because sometimes we think our social status or our economic status, it doesn't affect, but of course it affects. If a poor person or a homeless person comes in, you know, they're not accepted. So, you know, when we're writing those um, chapters, we have this hope that still we can't, because many times we, we do want to leave the church and I've asked myself why I stay. So coming from that perspective, that it's important because there is so much brokenness in our faith community. So we're hoping that this tool of intersectionality can help us reread scripture and, and how we can um, live out the faith tradition. Just very quickly, I wanted to address one more thing that you raised that was really important, which was about um, can we move this beyond conversations about Christianity? And I think that that's not only possible, but it's necessary. And Grace and I write some about the importance of syncretism and sort of recognizing that because we don't want to just sort of reinscribe some sort of Christian supremacy on top of all of this. I mean, we write out of those traditions, but I think we both do it in a way where we can be fully engaged with our own traditions while not needing to invalidate others. And in fact, recognizing that we can both learn from and incorporate those, those areas. And, and also we see theology as process, not as a, a, a content or a product. And so it's ongoing in the ways that we do that. Uh, but I think given the world we live in, that's absolutely essential that we do that, and particularly in this moment in, in our own nation.